The Roman Catholic Papacy is one of the oldest institutions in the world, second only to the Chrysanthemum Throne in Japan. Since its inception, there have been 266 popes, and a couple of anti-popes as well. The pope is not only the head of a religion, but also the leader of a sovereign, albeit small, state. The process of choosing a pope is unlike any other in the world. Learn more about the selection process for picking a new pope on this episode of Everything Everywhere Daily. This episode is sponsored by Audible.com. If you're interested in recent papal history, the audiobook I would recommend is The Two Popes, Francis, Benedict, and the Decision that Shook the World by Anthony McCartan. The Two Popes tells the story of the decision of Benedict XVI to resign and the election of Pope Francis I. Written by the screenwriter of the movie of the same name, it tells the story of how two popes ended up living in the same building. You can get a free one-month trial to Audible and two free audiobooks by going to audibletrial.com slash everything everywhere, or by clicking on the link in the show notes. Officially, there isn't a thing called the Pope. The Pope is just the English word for what the Italians and Spanish call Papa, or the French call Pop. The official title is the Bishop of Rome. How the Bishop of Rome is chosen has changed greatly over time, with more formal and codified procedures coming into place as time advanced. Tradition holds that St. Peter was the first Bishop of Rome. After leaving Jerusalem, he worked his way over to Rome, where he was executed around 64 to 67 CE. It isn't clear how the popes immediately after Peter were selected, but we do know they weren't called popes or even bishops at that point. It's believed that Peter hand-selected his next three replacements, Linus, Cletus, and Clement. The truth is, the list of popes from this period of the very early church is in doubt because such poor records were kept and Christianity was mostly an underground movement at the time. It is believed that most of the leaders of the Christian movement in Rome were selected by consensus or by church elders. There really wasn't a codified way to select a pope for the first thousand years. The small Christian community would vote directly in the early years. As Christianity spread, emperors started getting involved, at least with approving candidates. Eventually, Holy Roman Emperor Henry III just appointed several popes without the formality of even an election. In fact, it was Henry's actions that led to the biggest change in how popes were selected. In 1059, Pope Nicholas II issued a papal bull titled In Nomine Domine, or In the Name of Our Lord, that laid down the rules that only cardinals could elect a pope. And here's where I explain what a cardinal is. In the Catholic Church, there are three different levels of the clergy, deacons, priests, and bishops. A cardinal was an honorific given to the bishops of the sees surrounding Rome, to all of the senior priests of the parish churches in Rome, and to the deacons in the papal household. Other than voting for Pope, the only real thing which cardinals can do is wear their distinctive red hat and outfit. Eventually, the honor of being a cardinal was extended exclusively to bishops, and then to bishops outside of Rome. The distinctions of cardinal bishops, cardinal priests, and cardinal deacons still exist today, but now it reflects seniority within the College of Cardinals. The tradition of cardinals coming from the parish churches of Rome also still sort of exists, as each cardinal, no matter where they're from in the world, is assigned to be the titular head of one of the parish churches in Rome. If you visit Rome and walk past a church, you will see the coat of arms for the cardinal who is assigned to that church. The whole point of appointing cardinals as the sole electors of a pope was to remove political interference in the process. And of course, that only had limited success. After the death of Pope Clement IV in November of 1268, it took the cardinals three years to elect a new pope because there was so much interference, especially from the French. The pope who came out of this mess in 1271 was Gregory X. He issued a decree that from now on, cardinals would have to decide cum clave, which means with a key in Latin. They would be locked in until they had elected a pope, and there was to be no communication or interference from the outside. That rule still stands today, and that is why a papal election is called a conclave. The number of cardinals was originally set to 70 in 1587 by Pope Sixtus V. This number was raised to its current limit of 120 by Pope Paul VI in 1975, who also set the rule that anyone who is 80 at the time of the conclave cannot participate. Who can become a pope is pretty simple. Any male who is a member of the Catholic Church in good standing could, 
in theory, be elected pope. In reality, every pope for the last 600 years has been a member of the College of Cardinals. Pope Urban VI was the last non-cardinal to be elected pope in 1378. The last non-priest to be elected pope was Leo X, a.k.a. Giovanni di Lorenzo de' Medici. He had been named a cardinal at the age of 13 and never became a priest until he was elected pope. They had to hold off on the announcement for three days so he could be ordained a priest and then a bishop first. Medici money went a long way back then. For someone to be elected pope, they must have two-thirds of the vote of all the cardinals in the conclave. This rule has flip-flopped multiple times throughout history. Most recently, John Paul II said that only a simple majority was required if the election went more than 33 ballots. However, it's easy to see the problem with this. If your candidate doesn't have two-thirds of the vote, but it does have a majority, just wait it out and eventually you'll win. This was reversed by Pope Benedict XVI. So let's put this all together and go through what will happen during the next conclave. At some point, the current pope will resign or pass away. The word is that Pope Francis is very open to stepping down and had a great deal of respect for what Pope Benedict did. He's currently 83 years old at the time I am recording this, and there have been rumors that he would step down in 2020. We'll see. In the event of the death of a pope, the Cardinal Carmelengo, who is the head of the papal household, will verify the death. This used to be done by calling out the birth name of the pope three times, but now it's just done by a doctor. The pope's ring will be smashed by the Carmelengo, so no one can use his seal. This officially ends the papacy. At this point, until the new pope is named, the church is in a period called sede vacante, which is Latin for the seat is vacant. During this period, the Carmelegno will be responsible for the day-to-day -day workings of the Vatican, but cannot make any appointments or issue any religious decrees. The first order of business is the funeral and burial of the Pope, which usually takes place four to six days later. All members of the Roman Curia are removed from their positions immediately at the end of a papacy, except for the Carmelegno. Once the funeral has taken place, the conclave will begin two to three weeks later. If there is a resignation, the whole process is much smoother and simpler because there is no funeral to attend to. Granted, however, this has only happened once in the last several centuries, and that was seven years ago. As things are happening in the Vatican, cardinals from all over the world will be flying to Rome for the funeral and or conclave. All the cardinals will be staying at the Dominus Sancte Marthe, or St. Martha's House, in Vatican City. It's a dormitory slash hotel for visiting clergy, which was built in 1996. The conclave will be organized by the Carmelegno and the Dean of the College of Cardinals. Each cardinal is allowed to have an assistant with them during the conclave. Once the conclave starts, the cardinals will convene in the Sistine Chapel, and each cardinal will take an oath to observe the procedures and to keep the proceedings secret. At that point, the command Extra Omnes will be given, which is Latin for everybody get out, and anyone who is not participating in the conclave will have to leave. The doors are then locked, and no one can get in or out, other than in the case of a medical emergency. There are also modern precautions taken as well. Before the last conclave, the Sistine Chapel was swept for bugs, and all Wi-Fi connections are jammed or shut off, so no one can communicate electronically. All TVs, radios, computers, and phones are prohibited from entering the conclave. The participants cannot get news from the outside world, so they cannot be influenced. On the afternoon of the first day, a ballot may take place. If no one is elected, the next day, four ballots will take place, two in the morning and two in the afternoon. Each vote, called a scrutiny, is run by nine cardinals selected at random. The nine will run both scrutinies in the morning or afternoon if needed. Each cardinal gets a paper ballot with the phrase, Eligo in sumum pontificum, which is Latin for, I vote for supreme pontiff. Each cardinal will take their ballot with the name of their choice up to the altar, take an oath, and drop it into a ballot box. All ballots are anonymous. The ballot box is shaken, and then the ballots are poured out and counted to make sure the numbers match. The random cardinals chosen by lot as scrutineers will then go through each ballot, verifying the name and reading each ballot out loud. Ballots are then double-checked. If no one has been elected and it was the first scrutiny of the morning or afternoon, they will immediately move to the second scrutiny. If it's the last scrutiny of the session, the ballots from both scrutinies will be burned together. A small furnace is set up in the Sistine Chapel for this purpose. The burning of the ballots is a signal to the outside world that a ballot has taken place. If no one was elected, the chemicals potassium percolate, anthracene, and sulfur will be added to the ballots to create black smoke. 
black indicates to the public that no one was elected. If someone was elected, potassium chlorate, lactose, and pine rosin will be added to create white smoke to announce to the world they have elected a pope. In the event that someone has been elected, the dean of the College of Cardinals will then ask the elected cardinal if they accept the election. It is not required that someone accepts. It is assumed, however, that if someone were to not accept, they would let everyone know before a vote has taken place. The moment the cardinal says they accept, it is at that moment they become pope, assuming that they are already a bishop. If they're not a bishop, they would become the bishop of Rome after being ordained as a bishop. If in the event that the person elected is not in the conclave, they will be summoned to Rome and the conclave will be put on hold while they wait for them to arrive. Immediately after the new pope accepts the election, the next question asked to him by the dean will be, Quo nomine vis vocari, which means, by what name do you wish to be called? The new pope will then give their papal name that they will go by during their pontificate. Once the white smoke has gone up, bells in the Vatican will start ringing. It's at this moment that people around Rome will start to congregate in St. Peter's Square to see the new pope. The new pope is then taken to what's called the Room of Tears, which is attached to the Sistine Chapel. The name of the room comes from the fact that so many new popes cry at this moment because they're overwhelmed by emotion. There are several papal garments of different sizes on standby for the new pope. Depending on their size, the hope is at least one of them should approximately fit. The cardinals will then all come up individually to congratulate the new pope and pledge to give him their support and loyalty. After this has taken place and the crowd has gathered, the cardinal protodeacon, the senior cardinal deacon, will go out to the balcony of St. Peter's Basilica, overlooking the square, and make the following announcement in Latin. Annuncio vobis gaudum magnum, habemus papam, which means, I announce to you a great joy, we have a pope. He will then give the birth name of the new pope and his new papal name. The pope then comes up, gives his urbi et orbi blessing, which means to the city and the world, and the crowd goes nuts. And that's how you make a pope. Even if you aren't Catholic, the process of a conclave has a lot of rich history and tradition which has been followed for centuries, and it's something that only happens very infrequently. There have only been eight conclaves in the last 100 years. The next time one happens, you will now have a better idea of what's happening behind the closed doors of the Sistine Chapel. Executive producer of Everything Everywhere Daily is James Makala. Special thanks to everyone who supports the show over on Patreon. Please remember to leave a review over on Apple Podcasts. Even a simple review can really help the show get discovered in the sea of other podcasts that are out there.